welcome to another edition of Condo Insider. I was down at the legislature last, yesterday listening to testimony and I heard a member of the Real Estate Commission staff uh, say that there's 168,000 condominium units in the state of Hawaii. Now if you said, figured there were three people per condominium, that's 480,000 residents or pretty much uh, more than about 40% of our population. So we hope our show brings a lot of interesting educational material to board members and homeowners alike about living in an association. That being said, we've had a tremendous rise of the state bird, the construction crane. And if you look all over Kaka'ako and all over the state, we're seeing more and more construction for many more new condominiums. So I thought I'd invite back to visit with us today, Dee Hopper, who's a lawyer and expert on construction litigation to help guide boards through the issues that may be related to that. So Dee, welcome again to the show. Good to see you. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. Would you remind everybody a little about your background and your firm? Well, basically my firm has uh, focused on construction defect litigation for over 20 years. And um, uh, that is something that I have done, my partners have done, and uh, we have cases here in uh, uh, Oahu, we have cases in Maui, all around the area. And is that a prevalent problem, construction defect litigation? Unfortunately, it can be. It's, it's, it's more prevalent than we would like to see, but uh, you know, it's uh, in uh, condos and in townhomes and in individual single family homes. Uh, we've also seen it in um, uh, commercial litigation. It's, you know, it's not limited to just homes. So when a new board of directors and a new condo, I guess this applies to older condos that may have had a big construction project or a renovation project as well, but when that board starts to think it may have some problems, should it just wait till they know they have a problem or well, what should they start thinking about when they, when they suspect there might be some issues? We think boards should be proactive, in fact. What we, what we would recommend is that they contact a law firm that does construction defect litigation, tell them that they think they may or may not have problems, and then uh, set up an evaluation of their project to see if they, in fact, have issues. <coughs> now, is there any validity to a concept maybe after the construction is complete they should just get an inspection generally speaking or or you know kind of say well thank you mr developer and thank you mr builder but uh, we're just going to have everything checked out once is there any, any value to that or absolutely i think that is a very valuable tool uh there's you know they have a duty the boards to the members of the association to make sure that everything is is functional and running properly. Um, that's one of the things they can do is early on is provide and get an evaluation or an inspection of the properties and then to con continue to do that on a regular basis. So from your experience here in Hawaii anyway, I know you also do business on the mainland. Are there any particular, the normal things you find in construction litigation? Is it mechanical plumbing? Is it uh, structural. Is there any kind of common thread to all of this? Or? You know, there's really not. We've seen issues that range from, uh, uh, for example, in, in a home you might have cracking in the ceilings, in the walls, around the doors or windows. You might have leaks in the roofs, leaks around the doors and windows. Uh, there's structural issues. Uh, there's uh, defects with certain systems like the plumbing system, the electrical system, the air conditioning, heating uh, systems. Um, there, there is no single issue that we see prevalent in any place. It really depends upon the project, how it was built, uh, and um, what was done. And I would assume not everything they see would be necessarily construction defect. It could be normal wear and tear or normal useful life, like you know, sometimes buildings settle and you get some light cracking in the, mm -hmm. in the drywall, which wouldn't necessarily mean in, uh, it's a construction litigation serious defect. Correct. And that's why we believe you need to bring in an expert, some, uh, an architect, an engineer, somebody who's uh, familiar with these types of problems uh, to evaluate them. One of the things that I, and I know probably more than the average person about this, but you know, they always say it's the developer. 
the developer built me a bad building, but doesn't he really hire architects and engineers and they hire contractors? Is it, is it quote the developer? Or is it really a bunch of people? Well, it can be, it can be anyone from the developer all the way down the line to the subcontractor uh, that's involved in this process. You have the developer who starts it, they bring in their contractor, the contractor brings in subcontractors. And just like we, people always ask us, well, who are the bad builders? And we always tell them there are no specifically bad builders per se. This builder, you know, can have uh, lots of good properties that they've built, but they bring in the wrong sub or the developer brings in a certain contractor who brings in certain subs and they cut corners and you could have problems with that project. It's not one particular builder or developer that's bad. Does some of that come from, hypothetically, because the sub bids it and he bid it too low and now he sees he's going to lose money or not make any money, and so maybe, I don't want to say sounds intentional or unintentional, he starts for looking for ways to cut corners? That can very well be the case. Unfortunately, it can be. So when you're aboard um, and, and there's problems, I would assume that there's statute of limitations issues as well. If you don't, I mean, if the board starts to see the problem, I don't think they have forever to, to, to figure out when they're gonna do something. Otherwise, they could lose uh, their rights. So right. what, what, is the, what is the statute of limitations here in Hawaii? In Hawaii, it's 10 years. So what we always encourage boards to do, like you said earlier, you know, the sooner you start, the better. But if once you start getting, especially towards that 10 year period, that age in your property, you wanna be very, uh, um, proactive as far as getting inspections done to check to make sure that you don't, because after the 10 years, there's not a lot you can do. You're in trouble if you have problems. And another example is just say they saw something after two years mm -hmm. and they did nothing about it for six years, so it's now eight years into the project. Wouldn't that defendant, the developer, the contractor, whoever, be able to say, if you told me about it six years ago, it wouldn't be as bad as it is now, and you should have mitigated your losses and told me about it instead of letting it get worse and worse and worse. So doesn't that kind of say, you should get on this right away because they're gonna try to use the defense. I would think that, gosh, you've known about this for six years and you haven't told me, and it's, it's now worse than the fix that it was originally. Yes, I mean, you, you it's like anything, you wanna be um, active as far as looking for these things. Uh, if you're board members, uh, as far as your maintenance people, you wanna keep uh, excellent maintenance schedules as well. That's another thing that we've come across in dealing with this. Uh, because eventually, if you have a problem and the builder sees that you had it early on, they may very well try to use that as a defense against you. Can it be successful, that defense? It, it can be. It can be. That's why you want to. That's why you want to. Uh, you know, be active with these types of cases. Certainly, it's a, a plausible argument to make before an arbitrator or a judge that, uh, you know, judge. If I'd known about this earlier, if I fixed it, it wouldn't be anywhere near the cost or expense or the problem today as it would be before. So. I mean, when judges and arbitrators, from my experience, they look at that and they say, well, there's some validity to that, and that kind of maybe chops down mm -hmm. what they think you might be entitled to. It very well can, and in fact, in Hawaii, there is a right to repair by the builders. So they can come in and say, if, if you say that there is a defect, and the builder comes in and inspects it, they have the right to come in and repair that. And if they say, well, if I would have known about it sooner, I could have done a better repair. There's always going to be those types of arguments back and forth. Well, that's, that's a good point. Let's, let's go back and review the process. So the board, looking around, they think they have a problem. They see they do have a problem. They get your firm or another firm to come in and, and some experts, and they say, you know, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. What is the process from that moment forward? What, 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 what do they do next? And kind of walk me through the steps sure. that they go through. The first thing that takes place is if we go out, we provide an expert to come out and do an evaluation of the property. If in fact there are defects, we produce a report, attach that to a notice. That notice then is sent to the builder. The builder then sends that notice to all the subcontractors and then that group comes out and does their own inspection of the property to determine what types of problems there are. The builder then at that point decides, are they going to uh, make repairs? Are they going to offer uh, a settlement possibly for repairs or they're going to 
deny any problems. That process then, the next step is the mediation, where there's a mandatory mediation requirement in Hawaii, and the two sides get together for, the, for that mediation to try to work something out. And does mediation work? Mediation can work. Um, it, it, it's, it's really a difficult process if there is no pressure being put on both sides. The plaintiff side, the sides that we represent, the homeowners, we believe that we always want to get repairs done. We always want to move forward and get the case resolved. The uh, other side with the builders doesn't always have that pressure unless there's been a lawsuit filed. And during the notice process, you're not allowed to pre to uh, file a lawsuit until you've gone through that mediation. So oftentimes we find that it's after the mediation when a lawsuit is filed and the, and the builders are allowed, they bring in their insurance companies and their lawyers, that's when we find that there's oftentimes more pressure put uh, to the situation. And to clarify the definition, what is a builder? Is that the general contractor? Is that the developer? Is that the subs? Is that all of the above? Or when you say we give notice to the builder, who is that? It's typically the contractor, the general contractor. And do you notice the developer at the same time? Or We do. We can. It depends on the, on the circumstances on each case. But usually we will. And so... You've got an expert now to look at the costs and the repairs and say, I have this problem. Um, when, you, when you look at that, I've had some experience with boards that because all of a sudden someone said, well, we have a million dollar problem. Mm -hmm. They kind of say, well, we need a million dollars. And my experience in construction litigation and other cases is that boards need to have a realistic look at what they might or might not be able to get. It's never always one-sided and so clear that because an expert has said a million dollars, you can just hammer that in your head and say, I'm not taking a penny less. How do you feel about that? I, I think that's pretty accurate. Uh, oftentimes, if you say it's a million dollar case, um, it may very well be a million dollars worth of problems. Whether you're gonna get a million dollars to solve all of those problems, um, is the question uh, that you're raising. And more often than not, if you settle a case, if it's resolved outside of court, outside of a trial, then you're not gonna get that million dollars because it's a mediation or in some cases even an arbitration where the two sides have to come to some type of middle ground in order to resolve this. So. Yeah, we Sides need, have to be realistic. We need to take a break in a few seconds, but let me ask you one quick question for a quick mm -hmm. answer. Who, if, if an association files this construction litigation, who pays the legal fees and is that recoverable in the mediation? Uh, the legal fees are paid by, um, well, in our cases, we're, we're contingency fee based, so we don't get anything unless the other side, unless our side wins something in the end. And in the end, it is our hope that the builder will step up and pay those legal fees. All right. Well, we're going to take a short break. We're on Condo Insider talking about construction and litigation with all the cases and all the new building we have going on in Hawaii. We'll be right back in one minute. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to figure out how we're going to work towards a clean and renewable energy future. We have exciting conversations with all kinds of stakeholders, everyone who needs to come together to talk about renewable energy, be they engineers, advocates, lawyers, utility executives, musicians, or artists, to see how we can come together to make a renewable future. Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii.
Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're sitting here with Dee Hopper talking about construction litigation and why it's important for a board to examine these issues early so they don't lose any of their rights due to statute of limitations. And before we went on break, we were talking to Dee about legal fees, and I'd ask him about whether the legal fees an association incurs are recoverable in the mediation. And you basically were saying you hope that we recover it as part of the settlement because it's a settlement amount. More times than not, you feel that you get to meet legal fees. You think more times than not, boards have to be cautious about how they pursue this. Well, I think it depends upon the type of uh, the firm that they hire because firms approach this differently. Like I said, we do it on a contingency fee basis, meaning unless we recover something for the board, uh, the board doesn't owe us anything. We cover the cost and the fees in a case. Uh, there's other firms out there that handle it on an hourly basis where the board has to pay by the hour for whatever it is they're doing. But uh, we just have a different business model. That's how we do it. Yeah, I guess the example would be, and I don't mean to be unfair to anybody, but if you take a settlement offer, let's just make it up again for a million dollars, and the board thinks they need a million too, and you go spend $200,000 to get $100,000 more mm -hmm. on a traditional bill by the hour basis, you're really $100,000 short. Yes. Because of the fact that uh, um, trying to get that last bit of money the expense and the time and the cost, even the time value of the money, uh, may make it not a good a, a good thing. You have to look at this. And an example I would use is a, a condo association I'm aware of recently settled a construction lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And it was for a sum of money, a substantial sum of money. And it probably was, in fact, I know it wasn't near what they were asking, although it was pretty sizable. But when they looked at the case, number one, the defendants had a very limited type of insurance policy, so all of the claims of the association weren't covered by insurance. Then they look at the original builders and developers, the people involved, they didn't have much financial net worth. Correct. And so the issue is gonna be sometimes Where's the money going? Where's the beef? Where's the money going to come from? Right. There's because, a lot of factors to consider, mm -hmm. and you oftentimes have to compromise. And you find that to how it usually works as compromise in all of this? There, it really does. It really is. Very few of these cases ever actually go to trial to a jury for a verdict. So if it was going to trial, we got through the mandatory mediation and the and the and the disc, and to uh, evaluating the building for its uh, deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So this is we're going to have to go to trial. What happens? You file a complaint, then what? Okay, we file the complaint, and at that point, then uh, the next steps after that are what's called discovery, and that's where both sides get together and they exchange information. Uh, we ha ask for documents in a document production. The the builder, the defendant, has to then produce certain documents to us they will ask us for documents and we produce those documents to them after both sides have gone through and examined and reviewed all those documents then you sit down and you have what are called depositions depositions is where you, like for example we'll depose the expert uh, engineer for the for the uh, contractor we'll sit down and ask him all about everything that he believes he found were defects out on the property they'll do the same thing with our experts after we've gone through all of that process then we'll typically have another mediation at that point to try to resolve the case once we've gone through all of these documents and depositions it seems to me and I know nothing about this but that mediation might have a better chance of being successful because there's more facts on the table. You know, where early on this, uh, I, I've had experience where builders have said, yeah, that's a problem, I can fix it in the early stages because it wasn't a big problem. So that mm -hmm. early mediation has worked, but it's not primarily in major cases been successful from my point of view. Correct, I, I agree with you on that. And, and you find that when it gets to the second mediation, is it usually a mediation or arbitration? Typically mediations, typically mediations in what we do. Uh, there are some cases where there are binding arbitration clauses in the contracts with the builders, between the homeowners and the builders, and in those cases we'll go through an arbitration, but if there's not those types of clauses, then it's a mediation that we do during the litigation process. And then after that, does it usually go to trial or does it go to binding arbitration? Do people, when they, because, you know, trial has a lot more 
rules of conduct and procedure and stuff, I think. Mm -hmm. So does it, you find as they get really close to the end, they end up agreeing to binding arbitration? Is there more time than not go to trial? I think more often than not, you, you, your desire is to push it to trial because I believe that has more serious consequences and ramifications for the other side. Uh, I believe that the closer we get to trial, the closer we get to resolving the case in a solution. Well, let me go back to this mediation thing. Mm -hmm. As you know, um, under the current law, they have to go to mediation. And I'm going to take a minute and just describe this to you. Our legislature in 2013 passed Act 187 for condo associations. And the condo association basically had governing document issues, house rule issues, homeowner board type issues, can do what they call a value to mediation, where they can each for about 150 bucks get before a retired judge, and that retired judge was, can take the gloves off and tell each side, this is what I think of your case, and try to drive a settlement. There's currently a bill before our legislature to amend Act 187 mm -hmm. to allow it to include construction defect litigation cases. Mm -hmm. And there's a mixed bag on how people feel about that in the sense that the current statute only gives you $3,500 to do the mediation under a value of mediation and possibly another $3,500 or $7,000 if the mediator feels he's making progress and can resolve it with a little bit additional money. I have a hard time seeing that that would be really effective based on the process because at that moment in time, you haven't gone through all this discovery period. I, I agree. Uh, I think, like we discussed earlier in the program, the mediation process can be beneficial, it, but it depends upon when that mediation takes place in the process. When it's early on, prior to a complaint being filed, prior to the discovery with the document production and the depositions, it's hard to get any type of resolution at that point because there just hasn't been enough typically done for, for, for the, in our opinion, for the other side to see that they need to move on this. I guess the counter argument would be you take the first mediation, which we know is the builder's right and probably more times than not doesn't work. So now you get to all the discovery which you've paid money for and you've hired your attorney. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, well, can you begin the second mediation by beginning with Act 187 mediation and saying, well, let's try to get the first 7,000 from the condominium education fund. In a sense, we'll start it this way, but it seems to me, from my experience, those cases are gonna take much longer than the $7,000 war chest you might have. And you get the argument, why should other people in the condominium education fund, all the other condos, the 1,700 condos in the state, be subsidizing an individual construction defect dispute right. Right, by subsidizing the first 7,000? I might feel differently if there was a high chance of success with $7,000 to cure a construction defect litigation case. But the small cases, the, the really small cases, probably get resolved on their own. I mean, because it's not worth anybody spending all those legal fees to do it, so. Correct, so do, smaller uh, cases can have re successful results, but some of the larger, more complex cases, like we were talking about, you were saying a minute ago, you referenced, you know, a sizable case with worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, those very difficult. Well, I don't know what the legislature is gonna do on uh, Act 187, I know there's, uh, other components to the proposed amendment. We support Act 187 for homeowner, condo, board member disputes. Mm -hmm. We also believe that uh, uh, we want to allow the parties themselves to use Act 187 for binding arbitration if both parties agree. Mm -hmm. It just makes it another step to having finality to a dispute. But most of us in the industry have concerns about adding in construction litigation because it's kind of a a whole lot of other issues are relating to this that I'm not sure that having the a condo education fund subsidize it uh, makes business sense. But we shall see what the legislature does. Uh, uh, those bills are before the legislature today, and I'm not. Uh, uh, I think some of them are still alive. They've been passed mm -hmm. out of committees with changes, but no one has seen the amendments yet. So we're not. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a moving target over there, and and uh, so uh, it's a process. Well, I know that someone asked me today, uh, 
uh, whether it's causing me to drink more red wine. And I said, I am confident the consumption of red wine in Hawaii has gone up significantly since January 18th. Yes. You know, <laughs> I'm not taking personal liability responsibility for that, but I would say I played my small part on that because we uh, all do. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's it, the legislature in its own right is an interesting process and. Um, I, I frankly thank the legislators for their hard work. It's, uh, they're cast into having to do the best for the people of Hawaii, and they're not going to be experts in all this either. So uh, no, they rely on other people like yourself. That's right, and it's just like we see nationally and locally in in politics. There's two sides, and both sides not only argue their position, maybe at times exaggerate their position, and and sometimes it's hard for people in the middle, like the legislator, to understand really what is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I respect that and I've been in this a long time and uh, um, uh, all in all I think we have a good system and uh, but I'm just not sure about that part of the bill. Right. So is there things that the board can do to mitigate costs of, of, of doing one of these construction defect litigations? Or? Sure, I mean construction defect litigation cases are very costly regardless. No matter what you do they're going to cost typically a, a a large amount of money because you are involving experts on both sides have to come in architects engineers those types of experts come in and have to spend a significant amount of time providing reports and evaluations and inspections testing but um, again that's one thing that our firm does is we pay all of those costs for a client so that they don't have to and that then they are recoverable at the end of a case so we're down to our final minutes. So tell me, what's your number one recommendation to a board who thinks they might have some uh, construction defects? Uh, contact us, contact another firm, uh, contact a lawyer that does this type of stuff, get in touch with them so that they can then take you through the process of at least providing from the beginning an evaluation or an inspection of your property to see if in fact you do have defects. So in my lay term, just don't stick your head in the sand, investigate it because as a board member you have a fiduciary duty and by failing to investigate it you may expose yourself to some liability. You can't ignore these things, you've got to investigate them as your business judgment rule to make sure uh, that the, you have the best information for making your decisions. You took the words out of my mouth, you just don't put your head in the sand. All right. Well, again, thanks to all of you for watching Condo Insider this week. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Dee Hopper, and I certainly hope you never have construction litigation problems. But in the real world, it happens all the time. So, again, aloha, and thank you for watching Condo Insider.